amazing. Church, how are you? In just a moment, we'll get the lights on for you so we can read our Bibles. See? Well, my name's Pastor Rick, and I'm glad to be here with you guys. Hi. Well, it's good to be here with you guys. We have been in the book of First Timothy. It's actually a letter. And we're finishing the first letter up tonight. So if you would, join me in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we'll be starting at verse 11. All right, verse 11. Here we go. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in an unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. Well, let's stop there and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this safe place to worship you. Lord, we choose now to worship you with our minds, God. Help us, Holy Spirit, as we study your word. We want to draw closer to you. We are seeking you, Lord, and those who seek you will find you. So, God, we expect you to do a good work tonight. In Jesus' name. All of God's kids agreed by saying, Amen. Wow, we're wrapping up this letter, this first letter to Timothy, because there's a part two that we're going to get into next week. But this first letter, Paul has shown Timothy how to organize the church. He's talked about roles and responsibilities for ladies and guys. He's talked about how to choose leaders. He's set out all these boundaries because he wants his kids to grow a healthy relationship with him. So all these boundaries that he's set, all these expectations God has set through his word, it's all so we could grow closer to him. You see, Timothy was left in Ephesus. It's modern-day Turkey now. Ephesus was a seaport village, kind of like a San Diego a lot of trading happening, a lot of, a lot of business, a lot of life happening. And in Ephesus, there was also a big Greek culture. And there was lots of uh, false gods there, like the biggest temple to, to Diana or Artemis. You know, those names are interchangeable. And um, there, were, uh, there was a big Roman culture. So Romans had a lot of slaves. There was a slave culture then that the gospel has totally expelled over the last 2,000 years. But we see Paul talking about all these things that impact the church, how to run the church, how to oversee the church, what to expect from the church, the body of believers, not just this building, okay? It's the body of believers. So he's telling Timothy, who's a young pastor, what he expects on how he should navigate all these different things. And so we, uh, we come to this final close of his letter. And what we're gonna see tonight in his letter is a little bit of, of talk on spiritual warfare, a little bit of talk uh, more about how to deal with 
rich, like wealth a little bit. And he's, as he's going through his letter, you're going to see that all of a sudden Paul gets down on worshiping Jesus and talking about he's the king of kings. And it's like he just gets excited in his letter for a little bit. So there's a lot happening as we close in these final 10 or 11 verses tonight. So let's pick this up right at verse 11. We're going to talk a little bit about this good confession about who Jesus is right now. He says, but you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Well, last week we finished up all um, hearing about how money, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. How greed is just this terrible thing and how it leads men and women astray. It gets you focused on the wrong stuff. And so Paul is kind of finishing that that thought up and here in verse 11 he says get away from these things flee get away from these things and pursue righteousness he wants us to be ambitious he wants timothy to be ambitious about right living righteousness okay uh godliness we remember that godliness is like god likeness it's like pursuing God. Godliness is pursuing this character and conduct of God. He's loving. He's gracious. He's kind and gentle. We're pursuing these traits. We want to live like God. And how, how we can is by staying rooted in pursuing his word. Paul is telling us to be ambitious for these things. Right living, which is righteousness, godliness, right? Asking God for his character, character and conduct. He has some other like supercharged words, like faith. Faith is the confidence in God. It also could be that he's talking about pursuing faithfulness, doing what you doing what you say you're going to do. Be faithful. Be committed. Be consistent in this life of pursuing God, of living with God, Timothy. So we've got righteousness, godliness, and faith. Now we see this big word love agape love pursue this loving relationship this love attribute agape love is a self-sacrificing love it's an others seeking love it's a love that gives right not so much always looking to get it's a love that gives this agape love and we see patience As I was studying this week, I came across this killer definition of patience. I've always understood patience as being calm, enduring the storm with calm, being calm during the storm, okay, patience. But I read this, it's not a complacency that waits. Patience is not a complacency that waits, but a courage that continues in hard places. It's a courage that continues in hard places. Patience. It's funny, patience has grown, right? It's a fruit of the Spirit that's grown. We ask God, I ask God, Lord, give me patience. He goes, here's a couple of kids, Rick. Oh, patience has grown through the trials and tribulations that we go through. Have you noticed you never get patience when you're like sitting on the shores of Waikiki chilling out? No, Patience comes like in the year 2020. Patience came to a lot of people. Patience comes through like trials, it seems like. But what patience is, again, this like great definition I heard, is it's not a complacency. It's a courage, a courage that continues in hard places, okay? And finally, gentleness, meekness, power under control, power under control. I love that patience and gentleness are kind of put together because it does sometimes take great courage, right? It takes great courage in those hard places to not exert like all your power to smush the enemy or the guy that's nagging you in front of you or that just cut you off on the freeway. You kind of have to have great courage and exude or expound and reveal and display that gentleness, okay? So this is what we're supposed to be ambitious for. I used to think ambition was like not really good to have in the church of God. I thought ambition was like 
striving too much or too self-seeking. And it's taken me years to kind of get to a place where ambition is not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. But what's our focus with our ambition? Ambition really is nothing more than a strong desire. It's a, it's a great word for this strong desire to do or achieve something that re- is requiring determination and hard work. A strong desire to do or to ch- achieve something requiring determination and hard work. Is our ambition just to load our bank account? Is our ambition just to get the extra vacations for ourselves? Is our ambition to make our name great? Or, believer, is our ambition to make Jesus' name great? Is it, do we have an ambition to like really agape love, self-sacrificing love others? Is that our ambition? Like, what's the object of our ambition? Because I think that Paul is clearly telling Timothy, this is what I want you to pursue. I mean, he says it pretty plainly. Oh, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue. Be ambitious for, strive for these things, he said. This desire, we should have this strong desire to pursue righteousness and godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. It's okay. I read this uh, great quote from an evangelist named S.D. Gordon. He says it like this. Let it once be fixed that a man's ambition is to fit into God's plan for him. To fit into God's plan for him. If that happens, here's what he says. Then that man has a north star ever in the sight to guide him steadily over any sea, however shoreless it seems. He has a compass that points true in the thickest fog and fiercest storm, regardless of magnetic rocks. Samuel Dickey Gordon. It's the object. What's the object of the ambition? What's the focus? Where does the ambition result from? Is it God's plan for our lives? And if you're wondering what God wants from us, what his plan for us is, it's nothing more than to be in this loving relationship with God, and then through that loving relationship we have with God, love our neighbors as ourself. That's God's plan for us, to have a relationship with him, And through that relationship, we are conduits. We are pipelines of his grace and of his love toward others. That's really the only two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor. Verse 12 says, Fight the good fight of faith, Timothy. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold. Grab on to eternal life. To which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith is a pretty popular verse. Sometimes if you're, if you're watching, I don't know if any of you guys watch MMA. I do sometimes, sometimes. And I'll see a Christian fighter come out, and sure enough, he has some like hard-hitting like, like mix song or like some big dubstep, and all you hear is, fight the good fight, fight the good fight of faith. And it's like kind of cool. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he's going to go and pummel this other guy. But really, what it means is, Christian, as we have this walk, this relationship with the Lord, we're the ones who are going to get pounded on sometimes. And Paul is encouraging us to fight the good fight of faith. Paul's encouraging us to fight this good fight of faith. Um, we, we like martial arts in my family. And when my kids go to spar... And I'm, and I'm there, the first thing I tell them is, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Because they're getting ready to block. Keep your hands up. Paul's telling to his son in the faith, Timothy, hey, keep your hands up. Keep your faith up. Be on guard. Because there's a real enemy. There's an adversary. His name is Lucifer. And he really wants to rip us off from God. If you're wondering sometimes when you're praying, when you're worshiping and all these crazy thoughts that you're like, why did I think that? I'm in church. You're not the only one that that happens to. Happens to me. That's the enemy who has the power to influence and cast arrows, flaming arrows of fire, Ephesians 6 says. And we're supposed to stand firm. We're supposed to fight the good fight of faith. How do we do that? 
How do we fight this good fight? The word fight here in the Greek is agonozomai, which means where we get our word agonize. It means as we enter this contest, as we contend with adversaries, as we fight. How do we do this? We lay hold on to eternal life. We take hold of all the claims of a life of faith. We grab onto the object of our faith, Jesus. Grab onto Jesus as spiritual attack is happening. You're coming to church and you're realizing, oh my gosh, why am I fighting so much with my spouse? Why does everything seem to be going wrong? How come I can't find my keys? That might be just a disorganization. However, the devil likes to mess with us. He totally likes to pick on us. He doesn't want us coming to church. He doesn't want us signing on to watch online and get fed and spiritually beefed up. He does not want us to exercise our faith, to listen to God's word, to worship God in song. So he wants to throw everything at us. But what we're supposed to do is mentally, we need to remember that Jesus is the victor. That we may be in the letter of 1 Timothy, but gosh, the Thessalonians and Revelation, it plays out. And Jesus is the victor. Death is not the final answer for us, believer. We get to be with him, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, forever and ever. Close to that love, forever. No more disease, no more COVID, no more divisive politics, no more knuckleheads that want to just pick on us and bully us and make us feel like junk. Those guys, man, there's grace in heaven. There's worship in heaven. There's peace in heaven. There's joy with Jesus. Lay hold of that promise, believer. Grab on to Jesus. To which you were called, he says, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He says, Timothy, God called you. And in front of a bunch of people, you answered the call and said, I believe. Just like many of us, God calls us. He's pursuing us. He's drawing us near to him. But God's a gentleman. And he waits for us to answer the door of our hearts as he's knocking. He won't kick open the door of your heart. Did you know that? God won't force himself upon you. Oh, he'll set up things to get our attention. But he doesn't force himself upon us because God is a gentleman. And he realizes that love requires choice. That's why he's saying, Timothy, lay hold, take hold, grab onto. We've got to make the choice to grab onto this. It's like Jesus says, I'll give you peace. Remember what we do with gifts? He gives us peace. We can choose to accept his gift. We can choose to reject his gift. Or we can choose to try to cash in on that gift receipt and get rid of it and never use it. Or we can choose to accept it and apply it to our lives. There is eternal promises and encouragements. He's made a way, like that last song. Go back and listen to that last song after service. That's, a, that's an encouraging song. He's made a way. I don't get it. I don't know his whole plan, but I know that he has a plan and that he is sovereign and he's made a way. And he gives us these gifts in the form of grace and mercy and forgiveness. He's powerful. And it's up to us to choose him. I urge you, verse 13, in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed a good confession before Pontius Pilate's, He's like, man, I am telling you in front, I'm telling you in front of God as God is my witness. Christ Jesus is my witness. And man, Christ Jesus, here's when he goes on to his little worship trip. He goes, Jesus is so awesome that when he was in front of the Roman prefect, the governor Pontius Pilate, at the end of his life, he didn't budge an inch. He did not cave. He boldly went to the cross. Pontius Pilate may have thought he was the the prisoner who was imprisoning Jesus, but God was in full control of Jesus' life at that moment. He had Pontius Pilate right where he wanted him, so Jesus could minister his grace and his power, his gentleness and meekness to him. 
Christ was in control when he was on trial before Pontius Pilate. He didn't give an inch. In fact, what he was doing is he was unfolding God's rescue plan to save sinners. He didn't budge an inch. Instead, he revealed God's rescue plan to save sinners before Pontius Pilate. And right after that trial, we see the, re- we see the cross and we see the resurrection. He tells him in front of God and Jesus, I'm charging you, I'm, I'm telling you that you keep this commandment in verse 14 without spot, blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ appearing. He says, Timothy, right here, you obey this command without wavering. And Timothy, I've called you and the readers of this letter, us, to be blameless. We're supposed to be blameless? Sometimes I can't go five minutes without being blameless. How do I do that? Well, check it out. 1 John 1, 9 says, hey, when you mess up, and we mess up, sometimes big, sometimes small, but we mess up, believer. In 1 John 1, 9, Apostle John says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we confess, right now we're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 14. We're all on the same page. We confess that we are on the same page. We're in agreement. We're on the same page. That's what the biblical word confession means, to go into agreement and be on the same page about our sin with the Lord. Not the person who might be judging us or talking smack, but with God. Lord, I'm sorry. I messed up. Help me. He says, forgiven. I'm going to clean you. As I've been sharing this verse throughout the week at my different Bible studies, I can't help to think of when I, in my family, babies, I remember as a little guy, my grandma or my Nina would get the babies in our family, my little cousins, and they'd, maybe they got dirty or whatever, they messed themselves right into the sink and they'd be washing them and cleaning them all over. They were cleansed of all their germies. And I'm like, that's what the Lord's doing to us. He grabs his little children, all lovingly, he grabs us and cleanses us, however he does, by the blood of Jesus Christ that was spilt on the cross for the remission of our sins. That's powerful. That's powerful. That's how he cleanses us, his kids, his children. So keep a short account with God. You want to be blameless? Keep a short account with God. Talk with him through prayer. And he says, until the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ appearing. He's talking about his second coming, his coming again. Right? He says, which he will manifest in his own time, verse 15. He will manifest it in his, in his own time. I'm all about biblical prophecy, but it totally grinds my gears when I hear these prophecy people and they put dates and times on it. And I'm like, dude, you just ruined it because <laughs> no one's going to know. <laughs> it says no one will know. He's going to manifest in his own time, not just whenever you threw out a date and time. Now I know it's not going to be that time. But Jesus Christ will come again. He's coming again. We're in the last days. Why? Because that's what the Bible says. Jesus Christ will come again. When did he come the first time? Some people still wonder that. Well, he came in in a form of a baby, born in Bethlehem to a virgin, right? We're going to take a whole month to celebrate Jesus' birth. All about, like, how the Old Testament promised he was going to come this baby born of a virgin in a town called Bethlehem wow this is awesome that's when he came the first time and then Matthew Mark Luke and John tell us all about his life here on earth and then the rest of the Bible tells us how the church should be growing and and behaving and then Revelation says hey this is how when he's coming back this is what it's going to look like that was the whole New Testament in about 10 seconds he's coming again and until then We have his love. We have his Holy Spirit. We have him empowering us and loving us and forgiving us, giving purpose to our lives. 
Verse 15 says, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and the only potentate, okay? That's a little hard one to say. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. What that means is potentate. There's no one more superior than Jesus. He is the ruler of rulers. He's the king, capital K, the king of all the little kings on earth, the little K, kings of the earth. He is the Lord of all lords. There is no higher court of appeal. There is no greater authority than Jesus. When you feel, when you find yourself fighting the good fight of faith, we're supposed to lay hold of eternity, right? We grab onto these eternal promises, right? Because there is an adversary that's like trying to kick our butt sometimes, spiritually speaking. Ephesians chapter 6 talks about it. If you've never read through that, read Ephesians chapter 6. But here, we can remind ourselves of who Jesus is. He is sovereign, which means he's independently powerful. He doesn't get his power from anybody. He is at power. He is loving. He has been victorious, he is victorious, he will be victorious. He's who we're supposed to lay hold of when we're going through trials, which is a Bible term of saying when we're going through it, when life is spinning out of control and we're scared. Jesus is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He cares for every one of you intimately. Yes, he loves the world, but you are his beloved. I am his beloved. We have and can have, if you don't already, we can have a thriving, radical, intimate relationship with Jesus. You're that valuable to him. I love, years ago, Pastor Greg pointed this out, and it really spoke to me. You are valuable to Jesus. You are valuable to God, the creator of the universe. People wonder what their life is actually worth. And this is what Greg said, and I tell it to a lot of people. Look at the cross. That's how valuable you are. Look at the cross. Because it cost him everything. That's what grace is. It's a free gift we get, free blessings we get that we don't deserve. So that's how valuable you and I are. You were not an accident, okay? You were not an accident. God purposefully had you, purposefully breathed life into you. He has purpose and plans for you. Ephesians 2.10 says that you are his masterpiece. Well, I don't know about that. Have you seen my life lately? Well, gosh, it's hard to look at a painting when you're like right there on it looking at it. When you've only seen half of it, recently my wife and I, we've enjoyed building puzzles. And it is so hard to see it all when you just have all these little splotches. Or we, we, I'm the one who usually puts the wrong piece in and I think, oh, look, I got it. And then we can't find the piece. Well, it's because I put it in the wrong place. But I have this picture of the masterpiece of what it's supposed to look like. But what it looks like right now is a pile of junk. <laughs> it looks like a mess. And when we're sitting there right there looking at our lives with this microscope through our own eyes, through our own experiences, not through God's heavenly perfect eyes, it looks kind of messed up. But the way God sees it is he sees the end result. He sees all the brush strokes applied to your life through these tortured experiences, through all this joy, through this heartache, through this lost house, through this crazy radical addictions, but through this joy and victory over those addictions. He sees the whole thing and you are valuable to him. We are valuable. We are blessed to have this hero of heroes in our life. Paul goes on with his worship rant. Not rant, that's a bad word to say. With his like worship excitement. Verse 16, who alone has immortality, like he never dies. I thought you just said he died on a cross. Three days later, he came back from the dead. He was never, like, created. Jesus has always been, okay? He's eternal. No beginning, no end. Who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, 
whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Amen doesn't mean, okay, that's the end. It means, so be it. Okay, so be it. He's truly immortal without beginning or end, with a glory and a light which is fully revealed that would strike any human dead. Oh my goodness. That's pretty powerful. It's like what we see when Moses is like, Lord, I just want to see you. And he goes, dude, if you saw my face, you'd die, Moses. Close your eyes, I'll come right past you. <laughs> That's how brilliant and powerful God, God is, his light is. Gosh, I can't say it enough. There is tremendous application in remembering who Jesus is in our lives. The way we remember is one, by recounting all the great work he's done in our lives to date. Some of us keep diaries. I do. I keep a couple of like old letters that I, of like things that he's helped me through that are very encouraging to read. Everybody has this amazing love story, though, printed and filled of God's victories for us. How he raised his infant son, Israel, grew him and disciplined him right, through all those exiles. He brought forth his Messiah, the rescuer of rescuers, Jesus. He brought him. It it has all these victories. We remind ourselves when we study or when we sit down and go through devotions and read a piece of scripture each day. We remind ourselves of God's power, of his love, of his tenderness, that he is there when we lament, when we complain and share our frustration. When we share our joys and thanksgiving, God is there. His, this book, if we read it, he'll remind us and strengthen us. Okay? Remember, he is working. He's alive. He's active. Our God of this Bible. And the enemy, Satan, he knows this. But he's still dumb enough to try to rip us off and plague us and pester us. But God is in control, believer. Don't lose hope. He is good. He is great. He's powerful. And he loves us. Now, as we come to these kind of closing thoughts to, that, to Timothy, it's like Paul goes from this like amazing worship, like this is who God is. He's amazing. He's powerful. And he goes, okay, let me talk to these rich people for a second. I don't know why it turns like that, but that's what Paul did. And he says this, okay, gets into like let's talk about the rich people of the church that's so such an interesting change I just I found it kind of humorous it's like their spiritual attack God loves you ah love the Lord okay rich people pay attention one more time rich people we're getting back to you command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy Okay, so last week, Paul talks about, or last week, but for Timothy reading, it was just like 10 seconds ago, because we've got to remember we're reading a letter. It's just taking us like six months to get through this one letter. But Paul warned believers about the dangers of loving money and pursuing being ambitious for the material stuff over godliness, okay? So he warns them last week, or just a few seconds ago, a few verses ago, verses 1 through 10, like, hey, don't be putting so much weight and so much focus on the material stuff. Don't be putting a a bunch of focus and and your, don't put your whole lives on your stash, okay, because it's just trash. See what I did there? Okay, he says this, command them not to be haughty, which means arrogantly superior and disdainful. Why should, why should those with wealth, which all of us do, if you're like complaining about the electricity bill you had last month, that's because you were wealthy enough to have air conditioning. We have air conditioning and running clean water. We have clothes. If you don't have it, Ross is right down the street or Walmart is right down the street. We have clothes. Okay, we have cars. We have Uber if we don't have cars. We have friends with cars. We have stuff in, in, in this amazing country. We have an amazing stuff. But we need to remember Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, here's a reference for you guys to make a note of. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18 says, 
Remember the Lord your God. This is Deuteronomy 8, 18. Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. All this stuff comes from the Lord. But one of the dangers, one of the dangers, this is thoughts on the scripture. It's not from Deuteronomy. One of the dangers of prioritizing the material stuff over the spiritual is one may become arrogant, conceited, thinking more highly about themselves. Simply because you have money, seriously? It's a dangerous side effect here. Pride, just because of money. Tell them not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Don't trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. If you guys have Apple phones or Androids, you probably have a link to like uh, Yahoo stocks or Apple. Or Apple has a little business app, and you see for the last several months, like it, the stock market just crashing. And that might stress people out, but you shouldn't because it's a roller coaster. And if you look at the whole thing, it goes up. Ever since they came, it came into effect in the 19 like 70s or 80s, it just goes up, but it dips. It's uncertain. You can't trust in it. You can't put like your eternity on money. It just doesn't work like that. Trust God, the giver. Not the, just the, the financial gifts. Don't just trust that because it comes and goes. It seems like it's always in transfer. Okay? Money's a tool. It's not supposed to be our entire life. It's a tool to get things like air conditioning and water and food, coffee, Oh, love coffee. It's, it's a tool, okay? It's not our future. It's not where our hope is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be the object of our hope. God is. Jesus is. God's economy is way different than man's economy. It's a trip how God can just manifest riches. And I don't mean just financial. When my wife and I came to faith, we, were, we had to save up to be broke, But you know what he gave us? He gave us jobs. You know what else he gave us in abundance, seriously? Friendships. He showed us how amazing our family is. He surrounded us by a bunch of believers who we just cherish. Sometimes we weep because of how joyful we are about our friendships that we have here at church. We have some amazing people here in this church. And if you don't know some amazing people, get into a small group. Start serving or something. Because there's people there that will love you in a way you never thought you could be loved by a friend. Seriously. That's how amazing this fellowship is. Truly, God gives richly us all things to enjoy. It is not, please, everything I was saying when I was dogging on money, it's not a sin to have money. It's not a sin. But you're, you're doing something wrong if that's the object of your love and focus and direction of life. If it's just all money, 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 okay? That's not good. Anything that gets in between you and God is, idol- is idolatrous. God only gets mad in the Bible when things, get, things or people get in between him and his kids, which means his kids are his great love. He wants us to, to, to enjoy the things he gives us. That's what Ecclesiastes says. Enjoy the blessings of life now because life will end one day. It's like the whole book of Ecclesiastes wrapped up. Enjoy it now, what he gives. Verse 18. Let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Here's the thing. If, if you've you're in abundance here you want to do good Timothy tell them if they want to do good do good but that they be rich in the good works that they're ready to give and willing to share teach them to do good tell them prioritize godliness right pursue that character and conduct of that God shows us loving gentle generous have have self-control be patient pursue godliness tell them pursue godliness let their worth, their net worth be matched by their love for their neighbors. Like, just tell them, just love God and love their neighbors. Tell them to pursue godliness. Because, man, God, he just, he'll always give us something to share. Whether it's food, encouragement, prayer, an ear, you know, you share your ear to listen. Or you're buying, like, a, 
you know, a, a, some McDonald's for someone or something like that. Or you buy a burger on your way out for somebody else. You know, he, it just seems like that's just never a big burden, you know. I, I don't know. God will, he gives you the means to like give and love and do to others, okay. And God will make those situations clear for you. He will. The Holy Spirit will tug on you and speak to you, believer, when it's that time to, like, share and give, whether it's encouragement or some type of blessing. Like, he's going he's gonna to talk with you. Stay in touch with him. Ask him. Say, Lord, how can I serve you today? And just be ready. Be willing to serve the Lord. Storing up for themselves good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. Invest in eternity. Do the things today that are going to matter a hundred years from now. That's hard to do sometimes for me because I like to binge watch Netflix sometimes and there's nothing eternal about that. But man, there's still a lot of opportunity to do some good stuff, to love on people, to get involved with ministry here. We have tons of ministries here at the church you can get involved with. We've got a hallelujah party, shameful plug, I know. Got a hallelujah party coming up where we're going to bless a bunch of kids and give them candy and stuff. There's one way to help. I'm sorry, but yay, sign up for the hallelujah party. Oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge by professing that some have strayed concerning the faith. Guard the good news that he's given. That good news. Guard it. Right? Like, you know, stay firm in the gospel that Jesus died. He rose again. He died for sinners. He gives life and he rescues sinners. Guard it. But that doesn't mean guard it so much that you never tell anybody about it. Don't turn into a stagnant pond where, like, algae and gross stuff starts forming. Those ponds that have no outlet, right? Be like the stream where water flows in and out. Allow the Holy Spirit and his gifts to flow in you and through you. Guard it. But what he's telling Timothy here is avoid the babblings and contradictions of what in his time, in the first century, all these Gnostics were out there with their special knowledge of God that was confusing and false, that Jesus really never came physically, really. They were confusing people in the first century. He's like, you know what? Avoid those guys. There's too much work to do, Timothy. Get away from those guys. Not to say that there's not uh, room for apologetics here, because those apologetics, they, the, 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 they build up the church and defend the faith. But right here he's telling them, all this idle babblings, get away from these guys. Because, man, some have strayed away from the faith, getting wrapped up in all that. But he says this last thing, lastly, grace be with you. Grace, caris, unmerited favor. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. We talk about grace a lot here. Don't accuse us of saying giving cheap grace because it's not cheap. It costs Jesus everything to give us his grace, his life for us. The Gnostics would have told the first century people that he only came in spirit, not of flesh. He was an actual human being. If that was true, then there wouldn't have been no atonement or substitutionary death. There would have been no sacrifice for us, but that needed to happen. Jesus was sacrificed for our sins. Because the wages of sin, the payment for sin, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. It's by grace, lastly grace, right? It's by grace we are saved through faith. Saved, made whole, complete. If you're like, man, I don't feel so complete, Pastor Rick. Well, let me, here's the secret sauce. It's Jesus and his grace who will make you complete and whole, who will change your life abundantly, give you riches to be enjoyed, like his forgiveness, riches like the abundance of his forgiveness, like his mercies that renew every day, his mercy. His love, that never ends. It never fails. He loves you. That's all wrapped up in his grace. I want more of it, Lord. Sometimes I've even caught myself praying, Lord, I'm greedy for your grace. I want your grace, Lord. I need it just to get through the next five minutes sometimes. Grace to you, believer. 
Let's stop there and pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for this uh, time to go through Paul's letter to Timothy, Lord, his son in the faith, Lord. Lord, we want to be your children, Lord. We seek you, and we know that when we're looking for you, we'll find you. If anyone's here and they've never invited the Lord to, to be ruler of their life, if they've never surrendered, if you've never surrendered all your choices over to the Lord, if you've never opened the door to your life, and answer the knocking that Jesus does at the door of your life, then this moment's for you. If you'd like to know where you'd spend eternity, if you'd like to know that your sins are forgiven, then this time right now is for you. And we say this prayer every week because we don't want anyone to leave here without an opportunity to accept Jesus and to form that relationship with him. If the Lord and if the Holy Spirit's been doing a work on your life, then this time is for you. And we'd like to pray with you. So believers, if you would, let's pray with them. And the prayer goes like this. Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Please forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can serve you from this day forward. And all of God's kids agreed by saying, Amen. Hey, church, it's been cool. It's been great. If no one's told you that they love you, church, I love you. More importantly, God totally loves you. God bless you. Good night.